Welcome everyone to the Ranchers Thursday lunchtime webinar. This will be the third in a series focused on reducing costs in a cow-calf operation. Our speaker today is Mr. Brian Pugh, our Northeast Area Agronomy Specialist, and his topic is managing fescue and Bermuda grass pastures to extend fall and winter grazing. It looks like uh, we're going to have a good turnout today. We've had terrific turnout the first two in this series, and we invite you to come join us again next week when uh, Mr. Mike Trammell will be talking about fall seeding legumes to reduce fertilizer inputs. As we go along here today, uh, feel free to type any questions into the chat or the Q&A, and we'll try to get to those uh, toward the end of Brian's presentation. Thank you for joining us. So here's where I like to take the strategic forage budgeting to the next step is what we want to look at is if you focus on that November and December column, that's typically where a lot of producers start feeding hay is somewhere around the first of November. We want to look at what forages could fill that gap, so to speak. What could we grow in the pasture out there and let the cows harvest or graze themselves? So we see stockpile fescue, we see stockpile Bermuda grass, maybe a few of the legume options, which I think you'll talk more about next week. We also have small grains, brassicas, and stockpile fescue again. So again, those are all options for us. And for this first part, we're gonna look specifically at stockpile Bermuda because we do know that it weathers much quicker than some of our other forage options. If we get wet falls, uh, that forage quality degrades much quicker. So we need to use it preferably before the end of the year. And if you're more interested in in-depth in information on stockpiling Bermuda, we covered this uh, year before last in one of the other rancher lunchtime series. You can find that at beef.okstate.edu under the archive webinars section, look under the forage management tab and you, you will find more information on stockpiling Bermuda. So again, we're gonna work through here with the assumption that we wanna feed no hay and no supplement. And that means that forage needs to meet that cow's crude protein requirements and energy requirements on a daily basis. We can't do that with summer grown Bermuda that's standing out there because we would have to supplement protein on that. And we probably can't do that with most native grasses either, which would need protein supplementation. But we could do that with stockpile Bermuda grass. So briefly, we'll talk about some of the benefits of Bermuda grass, uh, managing that Bermuda in the fall. And for me, it is a great way to convert rainfall into usable forage. I think all too often as producers, we feel like once we get to September, most of our forage production is pretty much done for the year. And what we do know from research, that's simply not the case with Bermuda. About, if you look at the orange boxes here, each one of these numbers represents the percentage of annual production by month. And what you'll see is from September 1st on through November, we get about 25% or about one quarter of Bermuda grass's potential production occurs after September 1. And that's very important because we also tend to get this bimodal rainfall pattern in Oklahoma. We get good rains in May and June a lot of times, but we also get a much higher probability of rains in September. And that's exactly when we wanna capitalize on those rains and fertilize the stockpile Bermuda grass to increase production. So again, don't get into the habit of thinking that Bermuda is done when we get to September. It's not. Most of us have Bermuda already in our pastures. We just need to learn to better manage it in the fall and put it to our use. How do we do that? Again, we want to get that Bermuda fairly short, uh, somewhere to two to four inches tall around the latter part of August or first of September. And we're going to apply 50 to 75 pounds of actual in to that field to promote growth. Grazing usually begins after frost when that growth is complete, but you can start grazing at any time you need the forage. You're gonna expect about one ton of forage per acre. And what that means is if I'm willing to fertilize one and a half acres per cow, on average, that will give me about 60 days of grazing. 
This is some work that was done uh, both at Stillwater and at Haskell years ago on some of the preliminary stockpile Bermuda grass trials that we had. We've been able to show very similar results to this year after year across Eastern Oklahoma and Central Oklahoma. But again, what we see is, is protein content there on the left. The red line at 8% represents a dry cow's protein requirement on a daily basis. And what we see is typically November and December on a dry cow, we can meet her protein requirements. If we move to the graph in the lower right, which is TDN, total digestible nutrients, or also known as energy, what we see is we can also meet that dry cow's energy requirements in November and December with that stockpile Bermuda. Now, if we have fall calving cows, lactating cows, we may start falling short on that cow's protein or energy requirements in December, and it may require some supplementation. But again, this is a great way to look at this as a hay replacement strategy. It is a standing hay crop in the pasture. We can make the cows graze. I'm a huge fan of really managing that grazing cow herd on stockpile forage because every day we can make that cow graze versus us hauling that hay and supplement to them, we're saving money. So I'm a big fan of using some form of a strip grazing system to increase the utilization of that forage that we've already put the money in and we've already grown. And what you see here is typically as we increase from a continuous stocking system up to a strip grazing system, we improve the forage utilization drastically. And that's why I was using those numbers of 70 to 80% utilization is typically what we see on most strip graze trials. This is some data here, stockpile Bermuda grass, both from Perkins and from our research cow herd at Valiant. Uh, what you'll notice here at Valiant, 248 cow herd, we, stockpile a half acre per cow. So that's about half as much as what we would normally recommend, but we were still able to get about 38 grazing days out of that half acre per cow, uh, moving that fence daily. This was a daily movement of that fence. And again, that's not for everybody that requires quite a bit of labor, but we were interested to see what we were able to do. Uh, this would have been 2018 and 2019 winter. We had an 83% harvest efficiency cost us about 38 cents per cow per day at those fertilizer costs we had then. And again, weight change on that whole cow herd over that 38 days was only a loss of about nine pounds, which again, statistically was not significant uh, on that cow herd. You might notice protein was 12.7 and energy on that stockpile Bermuda grass was 59.3. That's as good as many of our hay samples that we take across Eastern Oklahoma from very intensively managed Bermuda grass operations. So again, it is a standing hay crop. Same thing you're seeing here at Perkins. Uh, again, very effective and very cost efficient way to feed the cow through that early part of winter. Uh, you will notice we're gonna see variations in yield from site to site. And a lot of that is just based on inherent soil fertility, rainfall that we get on that uh, Bermuda grass after we fertilize it and then also the length of time period that plant is allowed to grow before frost kills it. Just another picture, show you those cows. This was at Perkins. Uh, this is actually the uh, trap there very close to Sonic, if you're familiar with that area. And we were moving that fence about every three to five days. We weren't trying to make those cows graze it all the way to the ground, uh, but we were trying to make them harvest most of the leaf material off those plants. Okay, so now let's talk about what everybody wants to know. What does that cost? Brian, fertilizer's high. Urea was bumping $1,000 a ton. It's down in most places 800, some places getting closer to 725 to 750 per ton. I went in and used $750 per ton for these calculations, assuming that we stay somewhat static through the latter part of August, 1st of September. For this cow herd, based on a forage budget, I realized I needed 58 acres of stockpile Bermuda to run that 50 cow herd for 60 days in November and December. Per acre fertility, I need to put 50 pounds of N down to get that additional production. That nitrogen is costing me 82 cents per pound of N. And I know that's very expensive. 
But what that comes out to is about $41 per acre, which is $2,800 total cost, including that $8 per acre application cost. Okay, so I did try to put application cost in there because that's something you're going to incur. It doesn't matter if you hire someone to do it turnkey or if you use your own tractor. Uh, our ag economist and myself, we've sat down and looked at about a 75 horse cab tractor that's 20 years old. It's gonna cost you about $8 per acre with current diesel cost to get your fertilizer out yourself. So even if your equipment's not brand new, it's still costing quite a bit of money to get it put out. 2,842 total dollars to put that fertility down for 50 cows over a 60 day time period comes out to 95 cents per cow per day. 15 cents of that is actually application cost. Uh, so again, if we look back to that first slide I showed, traditionally, if we fed 30 pounds of, of hay at $55 a bale and four pounds of a byproduct feed, we're at $2.14 per cow per day. So we are still well above what we can fertilize that forage, grow it and let the cow do the work harvesting that for herself. Now I did not include any feeding cost in that. I wanna make that very clear. So I've stacked the deck against fertilizing your own forage because I haven't put any utilization factors on the hay or on the feed and I haven't incorporated what a feed truck cost and what it costs us to go out there every day and feed hay and supplement as well. So again, that's about 44% the cost of hay and feed. You would end up saving about $3,500 over a 60 day time period with a 50 cow herd. That's huge. That is a lot of money that we can leave in our pocket in a year like this when costs have just went through the roof. Okay, let's shift gears a little bit. We used that stockpile Bermuda grass to effectively get those cows through the end of the year. Now we're getting into that January time frame. Our risk of inc inclement weather goes up quite a bit. And again, I was asked to talk more about stockpile fescue today. So that's what we're gonna look at. We're gonna run that forage budget again for January and February. I'm gonna still use 80% utilization, assuming that I'm, I'm going through some form of a fairly intensive strip movement of that fence. And I end up with needing about 57 tons of forage. What you're gonna notice, it's the exact same forage budget that we had before. Now, the difference that we're gonna see is that each forage species has the potential to produce a different amount of forage in the fall or in the winter or in the spring. So our acreage may actually be different depending on the species that we're growing on that acreage. And again, if I have a fall calving herd, I understand those fall calving cows will, will have a higher requirement for dry matter to fill full. So again, they're gonna eat a little more than what those dry cows do, the lactating cows will. Again, I go back to my forage production slide. I wanna look in that January, February timeframe, maybe even early March. Uh, if conditions are good and if we get a good growing year there in the fall. And what I see again is that stockpile fescue is there, small grains is an option for us. That's really where we're kind of limited to in Oklahoma, good options for us in January and February, unless we do have some standing native grass. And again, if I had standing native grass in my system, I would try to implement it in between stockpile Bermuda grass and stockpile fescue or small grains. To me, that's where it makes the most sense, both from an animal standpoint and from a forage standpoint. Okay, so again, working through here, we're gonna look at stockpile fescue. And what we do know based on a lot of trials is we should expect more than a ton per acre of yield in the fall. We should get about a ton and a half per acre. So we're gonna work on through that. And when I do that calculation, that forage budget, that tells me I need about 38 acres of stockpile fescue to run those 50 cows for 60 days. So briefly, we'll go through some of the fescue data I, I have here. Again, this is not inclusive. There's lots of data out there on using fescue, stockpiling fescue, and even some of the newer novel lindified fescues uh, that potentially we could talk about down the road. Uh, we're just going to kind of do a recap of all of this information today, though, uh, and move on through this. 
So anywhere I go, fescue is always one of those words that as soon as you say it, some producers absolutely love it. Uh, and they will come up and tell you that's why I've been so profitable and so successful in my cattle operation over the last 30 years is because I have fescue. And then you'll get a producer that'll walk up next in line and say, the reason that I went broke in the cat cattle operation is because of fescue. So again, a lot of this is how you manage it. And I always go back to Missouri is the number two cow-calf state in the nation. And Missouri's been able to do that because they have limestone-based soils, They've had a lot of poultry litter in the past and they have fescue and they're they're able to run a lot of cows on very small acreages. So again, fescue is not necessarily a bad forage. We just need to know how to manage it properly. It can produce one to one and a half tons of forage in the fall and another two tons in the spring. And that's average. There's a lot of sites that will do much better than that. One of the things I really like about it in Eastern Oklahoma, it is adapted to very low pH soils. A matter of fact, we don't recommend lime on fescue until we get to a pH of 4.5, and that's extremely acidic. And it will also handle low fertility soils as well. It works very well in a year round grazing system. And there are ways that we can manage some of these toxicity issues. And we'll hit those briefly as we go through these slides. How do we stockpile fescue? It's really very similar to how we stockpile Bermuda. We want to get that forage short at the end of the summertime. Uh, we can fertilize fescue a little earlier, earlier in the year than we can Bermuda and not expect protein and energy to drop drastically because it does not hit the reproductive growth phase until the following spring. So it will hold its quality very well going into winter, even if we start growing it mid to late August. We do recommend that you stay somewhere in that 60 to 100 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre range, and that's actual N. That would be 60 pounds of actual N is 130 pounds of urea per acre. And again, fescue can grow a little deeper into the, the late fall time period so it can utilize a little more nitrogen than what the Bermuda can. Typically, we would like to start seeing you graze this somewhere in that early January timeframe or whenever your stockpile Bermuda grass runs out. One acre should give us on average about 60 grazing days for one animal. This is some data that my predecessor had put together. This was a trial that was done in 10 different counties. They took a lot of different data points. They looked at quality of fescue forage uh, that was either unfertilized or fertilized with 60 pounds of actual in uh, in a stockpile fashion. So they were stockpiling that fescue. And what you notice is that again, we did see about a one ton increase of that fall stockpile fescue was 60 pounds of N, which is what we would expect. You're also gonna notice there were some counties that due to really high quality, deep fertile soils were able to make a significant amount of forage production. Uh, matter of fact, some of those sites were well over two and a half and approaching three tons of forage production per acre. That is a huge amount of forage to take a cow herd through the winter if you have that type of soil. This is also some of that same data that come off that trial. I apologize about the blue background. I have never been able to pull that off in formatting. Uh, but what you're looking at here, we really wanna focus on this yellow line that you see uh, moving across this graph. That would be the protein content of a stockpiled fescue stand. Down on the x-axis, you're gonna notice the months of the year. So if we look at January, February, March, what we see is that we're well above a dry cow's requirement for protein. We're actually still well above a lactating cow's requirement for crude protein. So again, that tell, tells us, <coughs> excuse me, we don't need protein supplementation on stockpile fescue uh, for either class of cows, dry or lactating. Same thing if we look at energy or TDN that that cow needs. Again, dry cow needs about 53%. Uh, lactating cow needs about 59. We are well above the energy requirements of both of those classes of cows. So what we would expect, those cows should perform very well on stockpile fescue all the way through the latter part of winter. I'll just show you a few pictures here, kind of give you an idea of what fescue can look like. 
Uh, again, this is a uh, stand on my own place. This was back in 2018. Picture was taken in October, uh, sampled that in mid-December and had made about 5,400 pounds per acre. And this is on a very tight silt loam, almost a silty clay loam. Uh, so you, you see when you're on a good soil like that for fescue, fescue can really perform for you. And this was actually with 100 pounds of actual N applied. I also want you to understand, much like what we talk about with Bermuda, try not to get in the habit of waiting on a rain. I always have said, and my predecessor said, if you're waiting on one rain, you're actually waiting on two because we tend to miss some of those rainfall events. Go ahead and put that fertility down. This was an example here. I probably listened to the meteorologist uh, a little too much and they said our rain chances were dwindling. I decided not to apply any fertility on this site and actually missed about a three inch rain over the next 24 hour period. Uh, I then went in the following week, put my fertility down, but it was about three more weeks before we got any rain on that. And again, you would say, well, there's po possibility we lost some nitrogen from that urea. And yes, that would be true. There is that possibility. But what you'll notice is we still made respectable yields at 3,500 pounds per acre. The unique thing about this and why I include this in some of these presentations, this has been one of the better samples uh, that I have taken in the past as far as quality. 16% curry protein, 67 TDN. We're not far off of what some of our byproduct feeds can offer that cow in regards to protein and energy. So again, look at this as an excellent standing hay crop for that cow. That's that same stand there. Again, turn cows in. We're strip grazing cows on that stockpile fescue and they do very well on it through the winter. This was a February picture uh, from 2014. Same thing, you can see where we've just moved that fence on further back. The cows had grazed that fairly tight, maybe a little tighter than what we'd normally want, uh, but again, getting very good utilization out of that forage. And the cows still in good shape. Here's what I really like about small grains or stockpile fescue is that cows they don't mind going in there two to four inches, maybe even five or six inches of snow and digging down to get that green forage. We don't tend to get that response with stockpile Bermuda, but they will do that with stockpile fescue. And that means we're not having to go out, put hay out for those cows. We're not having to supplement those cows because honestly, they're getting very high quality forage as they're eating that fescue. This is at the tail end of fescue season, so to speak, March 15th. That's where the stockpile has almost played out. And honestly, at that point in the year, the fescue is trying to grow again, much like what we see with our small grains. So those cows could be pulled off for two to three weeks and what you'd see, uh, you'd be able to turn right back in on that field. Okay, so let's look at some cost again, 38 acres of stockpile fescue. I'm needing to put 60 pounds of actual N down at 82 cents per pound. That means I'm gonna spend about $49 per acre in nitrogen cost. And then I've got to add my $8 per acre application cost. So I come out to about 2,100 total dollars for that application. And that's only 72 cents per cow if I divide that out over that 50 cow herd 60 day time period. So that's still, very, very economical way to fill that cow up every day, give her all the protein and all the energy she needs. And again, I'm very close to what just the supplementation alone would cost me coming off the back of a feed truck or out of a bag. 34% of the cost to hay and feed. Again, I saved about $4,200 by being able to stockpile fescue. And again, I think that's why fescue is, is so enticing for a lot of producers to use in Eastern Oklahoma, if you have that option, is because it's a perennial. Uh, we can plant it one time and these stands can last 20, 30, 40 years. That means our planting cost goes down, prorated out over the life of that stand. So we don't have a lot of cost in establishing that stand over time. Another beauty of fescue is just its potential to make very high production in the fall. So that means we can run the same number of cows on less fertilized acreage for a longer period of time. Okay, 
I can't talk about stockpile fescue without hitting a couple points here, and this will be my wrap up. Uh, but I always have producers say, you know, Brian, I always hear about, you know, some of the bad things with fescue. And there are some negative aspects when it comes to Kentucky 31 fescue. And that's the old school fescue that's been around uh, since back in, in the 30s, 1930s. And that's in most of our acreage in eastern Oklahoma. What we do know, though, is that we get herds that, that have issues like you see on the left rough hair coat, poor performance, maybe even sloughing tails or sloughing hooves off. And then we also have herds that do fairly well on fescue. And, and we have to ask the question, why is that? What are the management decisions that are being made that change that? So again, what we do know, and I'm gonna to try to do this as briefly as possible, we know that the problem that we see with performance in our cow herd or any other grazing livestock for that matter, is that fescue harbors a fungus, an endophyte fungus, and that fungus lives in between the cells of the plant. And you can see that here, that's these small blue squiggly lines uh, in these stained microscopic pictures. But that fungus is not necessarily a bad thing. It actually makes that fescue plant extremely hardy and tolerant to overgrazing, tolerant to drought. So it's not a bad thing to have in that plant. It makes, it makes it very hardy in the environment. The issue is that endophyte, that fungus, produces an ergot alkaloid, uh, multiple alkaloids to be honest. The most common one is ergovaline, and we know that ergovaline does a lot to decrease performance of that cow herd. So again, that's where we get reduced milk production, reduced weight gains, you know, poor shedding, rough hair coats on those cows. And a lot of that is because it is a vasoconstrictor. So it constricts those blood vessels. We don't get good blood flow to the extremities. And that's why we will see tail switches fall off, hooves slough, things like that. So with that, some recent data that's been coming out of Missouri is we now know that is not a static toxin level through the entire year. That ergovaline concentration in the plant is constantly changing. And a good rule of thumb is if that fescue plant is vegetatively growing, actively growing, the ergovaline concentrations are actually going up in the plant. Anytime that plant slows its growth, we start to see those toxins subside some. So what you'll notice down here is that actually one of the lowest points of the year for ergovaline concentrations in the plant is when we are recommending you utilize stockpile fescue for the cow herd. That's January, February, and March. One of the times where I tend to see the most issues with producer herds is when we've allowed those herds to continue grazing infected fescue through late April and into May. And anytime we see that plant going to reproductive growth and that seed head emerge, that's gonna be the highest concentrations of toxin in the plant is in the seed head itself. So that's where we can really run into issues with a cow herd. Very simply put, if you want to have stockpile fescue to help from the economic standpoint, probably the easiest thing you can do is have a dedicated fescue field and then close the gate somewhere around April 1st to April 15th every year and go to some other forage like small grains or annual ryegrass until our warm season Bermuda grass starts to grow again. There are other options now and I won't spend much time here. You may be hearing about novel endophyte options of fescue. And briefly, if we look at the picture over on the left, the toxic endophyte, that's where we have that fungus in the plant. It's producing the toxin that can cause issues. 15, 20, 25 years ago, we thought, hey, let's just take the fungus out of the plant. We'll get away from some of those toxin issues with the livestock, everything will be great. And it was, performance of the livestock was very good. That's what you're seeing here in the middle, the end of fight free. But what we found is that those plants were not very persistent in the environment we took that fungus away that gave it that symbiotic relationship to make it hardy in the environment. So now what we have is many species uh, that different companies are selling that have a novel endophyte. And what that means is essentially it still has a fungus 
but it is a strain of fungus that does not produce a toxin. So again, that hopefully helps clear up the novel endophyte a little bit. I will leave one last thing on the novel endophyte. I get a lot of questions. It is fairly expensive. It's gonna cost 200 to $250 per acre to establish novel endophyte fescue. The question is, can I pay for that? Again, we put this together a few years ago. We were just looking at wheat. If we were to plant wheat every year, that's annual cost, annual tillage cost, uh, annual fertility that we're putting down, annual seed cost. But if we establish that fescue stand and expect a 10 year life, again, we're only having to purchase seed and to go through the planting process once every 10 years. So we end up saving money with these perennial forages, even in fairly short stand lives. And the orange bar there is an example of every five years, if you had to go back in and replant, we're still, every five years, we're still $650 ahead of planting wheat every year. So there are some real opportunities with some of these novel endophyte fescues to make them economically viable on your operation. Again, one last slide here. Uh, this was, if you totally eliminate it and put in uh, a novel endophyte fescue, this was Dr. Beck here, found payback time was about 2.2 to 2.6 years. Uh, if you were willing to just look at managing your infected fescue, so that would be through incorporating legumes or pulling cows off of that fescue, you could see payback within one to, less than one to two years. So again, we can make management of fescue pay if we're willing to put the work in. Okay, just to wrap it up here, uh, again, you know, I don't want you to think we can get totally away from hay because we can't, we still need to have some hay. Uh, traditional feeds that I included here today, we did not include labor, fuel, or equipment. Again, those costs were not included. So it's gonna be higher than $2.16 per cow per day if we're driving that four door dually. A uh, flatbed with a feeder on the back. And a lot of us have those, but again, we need to factor that into our cost. With this system that we just went over, you're only left with March and about half of April until we get back to warm season forage grazing. We could fill that gap with small grains. We could fill that gap with annual ryegrass. But again, we're talking about a 320 day grazing system is what we just covered here today. And you just accomplished, if you can do that, what 95% of beef producers in Eastern Oklahoma can't, and that's feeding less than 60 days of hay and supplementation. <clears throat> so with that, I'll open it up if there's any questions. Okay, Dr. Lawman just reminded me here, I almost forgot, we do have a poll that I'd like to send out. I've got a slide here that I do wanna show some results from. Uh, and it's asking about how many days each year do you feed hay? And I know that that can vary, but just give us a good average. Okay, and as those results are coming up here, I also want to point out, you know, down at the bottom, I can't stress how important it is to look at grazing that cow as long as possible. Just simply by shortening our winter hay and supplement feeding season by 30 days, that's equivalent to a over a 20 pound increase in weaning weight across the herd, an increase of two and a half percent in weaning percentage across the herd, and an increase of over two and a half percent of current market value. So I just showed you with stockpile Bermuda and stockpile fescue how to knock 120 days of hay and supplement out of your herd. I hope that you see that's much easier to do than it is to add 100 pounds of weaning weight to your average calf in that herd. So again, keep that in mind. How efficiently we graze those cows is really the name of the game. Thank you for responding to the poll here. Very interesting to look at that. Again, it looks like a lot of us are in that 60 to 90 days or 90 to 120 days. Uh, we do have almost 20%, almost one fifth of us feed more than 120 days. Again, what I would do is challenge you, if you have Bermuda grass in your pastures right now that you use, please consider stockpiling that Bermuda grass. Even when urea is $950 per ton, 
that is equivalent to a $35, 1,100-pound round bale of hay. We can get the same amount of forage in the cow's belly at $950 per ton of urea or $35 per round bale of hay, four by six round bale of hay. So again, I hope that's been some information that's useful for you here today. I'll take any questions that you might have. Excellent. We have a few questions. Um, first one is, could you expect similar results with smooth brome grass? As you see with fescue, uh, this producer sits in the heart of brome country up north. Okay, yeah, we, we should see very similar expectations as far as fertility increasing our fall uh, forage yield. And then again, we could hold that well into the winter. So we do get some smooth brome fields in Osage County in that Osage area. There are a few of those. I would suspect though that you shouldn't expect quite as large of yields with that smooth brome as what we see on some of these deep soils with Kentucky 31 fescue. It's hard to beat the yields that fescue would give you. But simply doing a forage budget that might tell you you need, instead of an acre per cow, you might run an acre and a half per cow and that would be plenty of grazing for 60 to 75 days. But yes, you could do the same thing with really any cool season forage. Uh, another question that just popped up, how does bale grazing affect hay cost? Mm, I, that may be a little outside of my wheelhouse, Dr. Beck. I don't know if you have any information on that that you'd like to talk about. Uh, and I'm sure not an ag economist. I know our ag economists could probably answer some of that from an economic standpoint better. Dr. Beck, do you, or Dr. Lawman, either one? That is not something I uh, have ever uh, did the penciling out um, on. Um, you know, in in the north, there's there's a lot of um, windrow grazing um, that's done, which would decrease your cost associated with baling. Um, you know, and and from what I call what I call bale grazing is where we leave the bales staged and then rotate cattle out. So essentially you've got the cost of the cutting the raking and baling the hay without the cost of storing or, or putting the hay back up. So there is a savings um, and probably less less waste if we can uh, manage the 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 consumption of it. Um, but yeah, I don't have a good answer for that either. And I, I will briefly mention, you know, we get asked quite a few questions on, you know, leaving the bales setting in the field and then moving fences around those bales. Even had some producers talk about not putting hay feeders around those bales to put fertility, put nutrients back in the soil. And for me, I feel like that is a somewhat inefficient way to get those nutrients back in the soil because of the cost that we've already incurred in that hay. So again, I'm not sure exactly what angle on the bell grazing we were talking about there, but uh, I'm a much bigger fan of stockpiling that forage and letting the cow go in and harvest it in strips uh, than ever having to pull the baler out across the field in the first place. So I have a few other questions. Your okay. rule of thumb for forage production with and without fertilizer um, is obviously tied to Eastern Oklahoma. What would that, be adjustment be for western Oklahoma with lower rainfall? Okay, so again, very good question. Your, your local county extension educator could probably give you a much better assessment of that within the county. A lot of that would depend on if we're talking introduced forages or not. And again, if it's a, a wetter than average year, average or, or drier than an average yield, uh, excuse me, year. So soil type itself plays probably the biggest role on that. Very fertile soils in eastern Oklahoma, Bermuda grass could make two, two and a half tons with no fertility. Uh, rocky, coarse, upland type soils, you know, we might see sites that only make a thousand to 1200 pounds uh, for the whole year. So again, that is a, a rough approximation, a rough rule of thumb. I would expect on better soils in Western Oklahoma to still be able to hit one ton per acre per year, even at 20 to 25 inches of rainfall. 
but what we do know again, and, and this was on the previous stockpile Bermuda series that we did a couple of years ago, if we're not fertilizing Bermuda grass, it takes about 20 inches of rain to make one ton of forage. If we're willing to fertilize Bermuda properly, it only takes about four inches of rain to make one ton of forage. So we can be much more water use efficient if we're willing to fertilize uh, those introduced grasses. Great question. Uh, another question is, uh, as far as the stockpiling, nitrogen only versus using uh, phosphorus and potassium as well. Great question. Uh, what we would recommend that you do in the spring on that introduced stand, such as Bermuda grass, is that you address your P and K needs at that time. Uh, and again, if you need P and K, then yes, you need to put it down. So if you didn't soil sample in the spring, you're only soil sampling in the fall to get ready to stockpile, and it says you need a lot of phosphorus, then yes, you should put that down to get that additional one ton of yield expectation. If we don't put that P or K down at that time, we, we shouldn't expect to get one additional ton. We may only get 1,200 pounds or 1,500 pounds additional because the phosphorus will be limiting that yield. So that's a great question. I do get a lot of producers that will just put the nitrogen, uh, but if you are deficient in P and K, it will limit your production. Thank you. Um, what's your thoughts on the summer dormant tall fescue, the Chisholm that's being released and talked about quite a lot in Western Oklahoma using it for a stockpile. Very, very optimistic about Chisholm fescue. Uh, again, it was uh, created as a replacement for wheat. Uh, it's a perennial, so it comes back year after year. The beauty of it is it should be better adapted to drier climates as we get I-35 and west because it can go completely dormant in the summer. We don't see that with Kentucky 31. It will continue to produce and essentially we can lose that stand when it gets really dry, especially if cows are grazing it. So I'm very optimistic about Chisholm. I do know there are stands in the Texas Panhandle and in New Mexico that are not irrigated and that have been there for well over five years, six years now. So I think that it is a great option for a lot of those producers that don't have Kentucky 31 or the other novel endophyte fescues as an option. So <clears throat> this next, next question will kind of gets into what we're gonna be talking about next week as far as adding legumes, but in a stockpiling system, is there a benefit of adding legumes and, and into tall fescue? What, what benefits would you see from adding legumes? Yes and no. Yes, there would be benefit uh, to have legumes in that. We would expect that cow performance would go up in the wintertime, especially if we had some fall production from those legumes. Uh, what I would also expect, though, is as we're going in and putting 60 to 100 pounds of actual end down in the fall, we heavily favor the grass compared to the legumes. So we would not see real healthy legume stands if we're putting that amount of nitrogen down. So to me, I would rather see you, if you've got fescue in a pasture as well, I'd rather see you incorporate the legumes in the pasture. Uh, you could utilize that intensive stockpile fescue field as a specific field that you only graze there in the winter. But again, if you're putting that much nitrogen down, that tends to really uh, promote the grass over the legumes. Also got a more of a comment than a question, but I'd like to hear you address it. Uh, John says, I've been stockpiling Bermuda for close to 10 years. Works good about three out of every five years. What one runs into is drought and army worms. It's a gamble. Yep. Yes, that is very true. And again, you know, army worms is an issue in the fall. Typically that first First to September time frame, we're telling you to go out there, cut it short, make it vegetative, and then we're going to fertilize it as well. And as everyone knows, that's exactly what army worms love. So that's something we really have to watch on stockpiling is, is army worm pressure that we get. 
And depending on where you're at in Oklahoma, it can be a riskier time to put fertility down. So if we're far western side of the state, you know, I'll give it to you that we do get less rainfall in far western Oklahoma than what we get in eastern Oklahoma. But again, September is typically a pretty rainfall secure month, county by county all across the whole state. So it is a gamble, but I'd also say that if you don't do that, it's not going to be a gamble. We know we're going to have to be purchasing hay and purchasing supplement, and we also know what the cost of that is going to be. So I feel like, again, that is a, a good risk to take. And what we do see on a lot of trials is that even though you might feel like you're not getting much production or much good, so to speak, out of the nutrients, we're still seeing slight bumps in yields in the fall, even in very droughty falls like this past year, dry September on record in eastern Oklahoma. We still saw some improvement in yields, but we also saw those areas that got fertility in the fall, the Bermuda stand tended to be healthier in the springtime when green up occurred. So, you know, those are some things to think about, uh, maybe selling points for going ahead, biting the bullet, getting that fertilizer put down and banking on trying to stockpile that forage. Brian, Great question. If, if I can make just a comment there, uh, that question comes up quite a bit, maybe related to John's question. Uh, what percentage of that, let's say you put 50 pounds down and late August, would you anticipate would still be available the following whatever, March or April? Uh, that's that's an important an important number, seems like. Okay, so another good question. Let's assume for a minute that we're saying absolutely no rain. There would be large potential to lose a lot of that by the time we get to next spring. So, you know, we have mechanisms to lose that through ammonia volatilization. We also have mechanisms to start to lose that through leaching, nitrate leaching, maybe the next spring. Again, if it's dry, we're not going to have any of that. Some of that ammonium would still be in the soil, but yes, potential losses could be well over 50% of that if we don't get any rain from August until the next March. And I know spots in the panhandle actually saw that this last year. Uh, but actually, Dana Zook, she's our area livestock specialist for uh, Northwest Oklahoma, and I just filmed a podcast here recently. We went back through a lot of data in western Oklahoma, and what we found is that a lot of those sites actually got two to two and a half inches plus of rain in September almost every year. So we feel like there's still good potential for stockpile Bermuda or even stockpile old world blue stem to work in western Oklahoma. Good question. The uh, question from Clark Gray, we have uh, Johnson grass in Bermuda. Will that is affect strip grazing? And should he kill the Johnson grass before stockpiling? I would say that's up to you. You know, honestly, a lot, a lot of times we do see Johnson grass will have higher quality than what Bermuda will as far as protein and energy. It's a very high quality forage. Uh, especially if it's kept very, very young in a small vegetative state. I don't know that I would worry about a lot of other grass species. Very rarely do we get pure stands of Bermuda. What I would be very careful of is having cows in that field when frost occurs. You know, prussic acid would still be a consideration that, that I'd be concerned with. As soon as that plant totally browns out, prussic is no longer a concern but it might be worth checking nitrates if we've been in a fairly dry fall as well, because we did fertilize that and put additional nitrogen on it to stockpile. So again, I've got Johnson grass in some of my own stockpile Bermuda fields. I don't worry a whole lot about it. Again, if it's 50% of the stand, we might need to manage that a little bit differently. I hope that answered that question. Thank you very much. So with that, we will uh, end today's uh, Ranchers Thursday lunchtime series. And uh, once again, would remind everybody to fill out the exit survey before they leave. And uh, thank you very again very much, Brian. Yeah. Great job, Brian. Look forward to Mike Trammell talking about uh, trying to reduce uh, nitrogen fertilizer costs by incorporating legumes next week. That'll be a very important topic as well. Thanks, everyone. Hope to see you next week.